Good morning, everybody, and a very warm welcome to you. <coughs> Understandably, we're a bit thin on the ground uh, this morning. Uh, the weather, as you know, um, has been pretty awful, hasn't it? And we've uh, sadly had some damage to the roof of uh, the schoolroom. Um, and thank you very much, um, Morrison and the deacons, for um, seeing um, to that act. I'm sure it will be fixed as soon as it is um, possible. But thankfully, there's no water coming through. So um, we won't have to wear our armbands tonight. Uh, in tonight's service, um, it's perfectly dry in there. But it is a Baptist church, isn't it? So it should be all over us uh, uh, um, so thank you, all of you, thank you for coming this morning on such a dreadful, dreadful <coughs> morning. Now then, shall we have a look at the announcements for the coming weeks? Six o'clock tonight then, as I said, our evening service. It's a communion service tonight as well. Uh, there's a lady circle meeting tomorrow at 2.30 um, and the subject, humour. So I'm sure that will be uh, worth attending, especially if you're miserable. <laughs> um, now then, uh, Monday also, there's um, a, a meeting down in Waterfront Community Church um, regarding the persecuted uh, Christians in flight. Now, is that information in the, in, in the, it's in the link as well, so do have uh, a good read of that in your link. Now, there will be Bible study. Um, John isn't here this morning, um, but if, in the links it says there's no Bible study, but there will be Bible study this week, the usual um, days and times. Uh, they're in person, of course. Prayer meeting, <coughs> excuse me, is a Zoom prayer meeting this week at um, 7.15 Wednesday night. Um, the next uh, in-person one will be Wednesday, the 2nd of March, and then the 16th of March. Forget me not, as per usual, um, this coming week, the usual days and times. And the Siloam Ladies uh, Bible Study, it had to be, of course, um, postponed on Friday because of the of the weather warning. So the next one is on the 4th of March. Uh, it's in person, of course, and Janet will be leading that one. And then on the 18th, a fortnight later, of course, Pauline will be leading it. And there's no kids club this week, of course, because it's half term. For some reason, the Hallelujah Chorus is ringing in my mind. The food bank, the food bank um, is uh, in need of our support as always. So if you could um, keep that in mind as well. Fellowship news. Um, nothing springs to mind. Uh, nothing specifically, thankfully, springs to mind. Um, uh, but we pray. We, we do pray for those that are unwell, uh, those that we know, whether they're um, connected directly or indirectly to our fellowship, we pray for them. And those, of course, who are grieving um, at this time, we pray God's comfort upon them. I think that's it then, isn't it? Yeah, that's, uh, that's great. So shall we bow our heads? <clears throat> Lord, my Heavenly Father, we've certainly felt the power of the wind over the last few days. It seems to have reached every corner, Lord. And we just pray that as we worship you this morning, that the power of your spirit will reach every corner of our beings, that it will reach every corner of this chapel. We ask, Lord, that your name will be 
glorified as we worship you here this morning. Protect us, bless us, allow us to see no one but Jesus only. For we ask in his precious name. Amen. Well now then, shall we um, sing together the hymn, Breathe on us, Breath of God. Shall we stand? Continue with our worship 
and we shall sing together uh, the hymn, His Mercy is More. So shall we stand to sing this hymn? Our sins, they are indeed many. 
but your mercy is more. Thank you for what we are told in your word that even our as our sins increase, grace increases all the more. Oh, thank you, Lord. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for your Son. Thank you for the cross and all that was accomplished there. Thank you for those words, it is finished. Thank you for that empty grave, the fact that we have a living Lord and Saviour, an exalted Lord and Saviour who lives to intercede for us, who has given us the promised Holy Spirit. Oh Lord, why have you given us so much when we deserve so little? Indeed, we deserve the opposite of what you have given us and what you continue to give us. We are worthy to be rejected, to be condemned. But Lord, such is your grace, such is your love, your mercy is more. And again, <clears throat> Lord, we praise your holy name. But you have also promised never to leave us, never to forsake us. And in our lives, from day to day, Lord, in all the things that we have to face in, <coughs> excuse me, in our daily lives, we ask that you would give us wisdom in all that we say and do. We ask, Lord, that you would give us peace to allow us to experience your peace, your time event, which transcends understanding. And we thank you that we can bring those to you that we know and love, Lord, who are struggling at this time, those struggling with ill health. You know who they are. We would especially bring Dudley to you. We continue to uphold Dudley in our prayers and his family also. What a difficult journey it is, an often painful, stressful journey. And we just pray that Dudley and all the family will be able to experience your peace through it all. And indeed, Lord, we know that there are quite a few broken hearts in Siloam at the moment, Lord. And somehow, days like today, when the weather is rather unpleasant, when we feel forced almost to stay indoors. These feelings of grief and loneliness, they seem to be amplified. So we just ask your comfort, Lord, and to allow these people to be so aware of your presence with them. Help them to turn to your word Help them to turn to your throne in prayer and speak to the Lord. And indeed help us all to rest upon you. Your word, your love, your presence with us. <coughs> Therefore please bless us Please forgive us all our sins and bless your people everywhere. For we ask in the precious name of Jesus who taught us when praying to offer this prayer together. 
our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Well, we have such a faithful God, don't we? So we can celebrate that faithfulness through singing the next hymn, Great is Thy Faithfulness. <coughs> Silent service. We had 
um, a tiny break from this series last Sunday morning, didn't we, where we looked at the nature of um, love, where we looked at 1 Corinthians 13. Well, this morning we return to the theme of silent service when we look at the ladies in the morning and the gentlemen in the evening. And who else, who else uh, should we look at this morning um, but Eunice, isn't it? I'm sure you'll be delighted um, to hear that we're looking at Eunice. But Morrison, you can testify. I sent you the details, didn't I, of this morning's service on Monday before I heard that there was a storm, Eunice, on the way. Um, and we were supposed to go um, over the last few days up to North Wales to visit Rhiannon's grandmother, who was 96, and she is called Eunice as well. So I never want to hear the, word, the name Eunice for a long, long time after this weekend. And we're going to turn to 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 5. Um, Paul, obviously, writing to Timothy, I am reminded of your sincere faith, which first lived in your grandmother Lois and in your mother Eunice. And I am persuaded now lives in you also. I have been reminded of your sincere faith, which first lived in your grandmother Lois and in your mother Eunice. And I am persuaded now lives in you also. Great victory. That's what even this uh, means, by the way. Great victory. Um, a lovely meaning for a name. And she believed in one who had indeed a great victory. Uh, a great victory over sin, a great victory over death, a great victory over Satan. Uh, uh, and we share that same Saviour, don't we? That's why we're here this morning, because we are a people that um, have trusted and continue to trust in Jesus Christ as our Lord and Saviour, the one who has had a great victory. But there are three things about um, the faith of Eunice I would like to share with you this morning. First of all, clearly, um, she had an evident faith. Her faith was clear for all to see. In the book of Acts, chapter 16, and the first verse, we read these words, Paul came to Derby and then to Lystra, where a disciple named Timothy lived, whose mother was Jewish and a believer, but whose father was a Greek. That's how Luke, the author of the book of Acts, identified um, Eunice identified her as a believer, a Jew and a believer, a believer in Jesus Christ as her Lord and Saviour. She believed Jesus to be the Son of God and her Lord and Saviour. And this was evident in her life. It's one thing to say that we are a believer, or are believers, but it's another thing to produce evidence. And of course, this is what Jesus wants from us. He wants us to produce evidence, or the word we find in the Bible, of course, fruit, isn't it? Because it's by uh, the fruit uh, we recognize the tree or the plant or whatever. And I ask myself, what have I done? What am I doing to um, reveal Jesus 
in me. When people look at me and listen to me and look at the way that I behave and act, do they see Jesus? And as I said last week, the clearest way of expressing our faith in Jesus is through love, isn't it? And it's not me saying it, indeed it's Jesus himself. In John chapter 13, by this everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. And that's just one verse of many that emphasize this point. That if we love one another, well that is evidence of being his disciples. There are many who misquote, and, I, and I'd like to spend a bit more time in hopefully the near future looking at this. There's a, there are those who misquote uh, St. Francis of Assisi. Um, he didn't say this at all. Um, uh, and even though these words are attributed to him, he didn't say them. Um, preach the gospel, use words if necessary. Now, I, I understand the sentiment, right? I understand the sentiment behind that. That basically our works, our actions, our deeds should complement our faith, should be consistent with our faith. But at the same time, I don't like the words um, if necessary, as if proclaiming the word is something that, oh, you know, nobody <laughs> likes to do, nobody likes to hear, um, but we better do it if necessary. Well, that's all I would say is look at Jesus. He was perfect in word and deed. Not once did Jesus sin. Not once did Jesus do or say anything that was against God's will, God's law. He is and was the full representation, the exact representation of God. Yet, even though he was perfect in deed, in works, in actions, Jesus needed words. How many parables do we see in the Gospels? How many times do we see Jesus teach as one who had authority? Even the one who was perfect in deed, in actions, needed words, needed to preach, needed to proclaim. It is through preaching, through sharing with our lips that so many have been saved. Yes, our deeds can do a lot of damage or they can affirm what has been said and what we say. But we mustn't take away the importance of the value of preaching that it's through the spoken word, isn't it, that God calls so many to repentance and to salvation, but it has to be backed up by our deeds. As James says in his epistle, faith without action, without deeds, is dead. That's the identity she had. Eunice um, was a believer. But secondly, we are told that her faith was sincere. Yes, Paul was writing to Timothy, I am reminded of your sincere faith, but which first lived in your grandmother Lois and in your mother Eunice. Now, I like the word 
sincere, okay? But in the authorised version, the word unfeigned is used. Unfeigned. And I think it says a little bit more than sincere. Would you agree? Unfeigned. Paul commends Timothy's mother and grandmother as having this kind of faith. Now Paul says the idea of seeing Timothy fills him with joy when he remembers that kind of sincere or unfeigned faith. What is an unfeigned faith? Well, it's not a faith for show, isn't it? It's not a faith for shame, for show. Are we Christians all the time, or only when Christian friends are looking? Do we worship God on Sunday and worship the world the other six days? Do you like country and western music? Do you? Some of you? Yeah, yeah. The odd shrug of your shoulder, the odd nod. Yes, yeah. Um, uh, Lisa uh, sprang into action <laughs> when I asked, uh, you like the country and western? Do you? Yeah, yeah? great, great. Uh, Blake Shelton, does that name ring a bell? No, no, well, there we are then. Well, he's got a, a, a lovely little song, uh, Who Are You When I'm Not Looking? Who Are You When I'm Not Looking? Now, God looks at everything. Not a single word, not a single thought, not a single action escapes God's attention. And imagine all the millions, all the billions of people that have ever lived God knows every thought, every action, every word of everyone. Isn't that amazing? Mm -hmm. Such an amazing God. We can't hide anything from God, but we can hide things from one another, can we? Somebody once asked Spurgeon, how do you know if someone is a Christian or not? And he said, well, it depends what they're like at home, behind the closed door. I used to be on a, a board of governors. That sounds important, doesn't it? Um, of a primary school once. I hated the experience. I absolutely hated the experience for so many reasons. It was very, I don't know how you can do it, uh, Morris. And, uh, it was a very, very stressful uh, experience. And one of the things we had to do was uh, appoint a new head, right? And somebody from um, uh, the education uh, authority came to, to help us, right? Because I didn't know how to <laughs> appoint a head. I didn't even know where to start. I didn't know where to, to begin. I didn't know what questions to ask. Or anything, you know. So this uh, person's input was was very important. And I've got to be honest with you, you know, that the first person we interviewed, I thought, oh, there we are. Look no further, you know. We found the right person for the job. And then, of course, the second person had an interview, and I thought, oh gosh, <laughs> I think uh, they are the right person for the job, and so on and so forth, we don't know, and we were all in a bit of a quandary, but this person, fair play, just said, just remember this, everybody can put on a show, everybody can put on a show, uh, and when, um, when one of the worst things um, that teachers have to go through, I'm sure, is the inspection, isn't it? Every so many years, um, the, the inspection must be a very, very stressful experience. And you have to ask, all right, 
the, the days when the, the inspectors are there, is that a true reflection of the school the rest of the time? No. Well, I'm not going to tell you who, but the teacher uh, in the congregation has just gone like that. So there's, there's your answer. Everybody can put on a show. If one of those inspectors at any other time just turned up on a bad day, would they be seeing exactly the same um, thing? I'm just glad that inspectors don't come to kids' club. <laughs> but I'd be sacked, I'm sure, uh, in no time uh, at all. Who are you when I'm not looking? Jesus said, God desires us to worship him in spirit and in truth. Anybody can put on a show, but God sees the heart. Isn't that what we read in the first book of Samuel? People look at the outside. God looked or looks at the heart. That means to worship in a spirit of worship and to be sincere and famed in our worship. How does God see us? That's the main thing, isn't it? An unfeigned faith. An evident faith. An unfeigned faith. And thirdly and lastly, she had an influential faith. One of my favourite games with my grandfather, and there's something about uh, going to visit your grandparents, isn't there, as a child. Um, no matter what you've got at home, the toys and the games your grandparents have, they always seem to be that much more fun, don't they? Snakes and ladders. Oh, how I miss snakes and ladders. Um, dominoes. I used to love playing dominoes with my um, grandfather. And of course, uh, when, the, when he got a bit tired of beating me, <laughs> um, he would go and have a nap and let me fiddle around with the domino sound, you know, the game, the domino effect, isn't it? You know, get them all in a line or in funny shapes and push one down and boom, they would all fall um, down. Um, it all started with one, didn't it? It all started with one, but it affected um, every one of them. Now, it's impossible to overstate how important Timothy was to Paul. He refers to Timothy as his co-worker, his son, his brother, he was present with Paul in writing several of his epistles. And listen to these words uh, he wrote to the Corinthian church. His first epistle, I sent you Timothy, who is my beloved and faithful child in the Lord, to remind you of my ways in Christ Jesus, as I teach them everywhere and in every church. He had full confidence in Timothy, didn't he? He knew when he was sending Timothy to a church that he was sending someone who was so sound in the faith and that his actions, his deeds backed up that faith. He had full confidence in Timothy. But his mother Eunice and his grandmother Lois clearly played a huge part in his faith and discipleship. A witness and discipleship based on the Bible, on the scriptures. Can I quote to you to Timothy chapter 3? Now listen carefully to these words Paul writing 
to Timothy. But as for you, Timothy, continue in what you have learned and have become convinced of because you know those from whom you learned it and how from infancy you have known the holy scriptures which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Jesus Christ or in Christ Jesus. All scripture is God breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting and training in righteousness so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. So Timothy was clearly a very influential Christian, wasn't he? His work and ministry, his testimony touched the hearts of many people. Many people came to a saving faith through Timothy. The Christian church was built up in faith, in knowledge, in understanding through Timothy. As I've already said, Paul had tremendous faith and trust in him, tremendous confidence in him. He knew if he asked Timothy to do something, it's as good as done. He was desperate to have Timothy's fellowship whenever it was possible. But we mustn't underestimate the influence Eunice and Lois had on, on Timothy. A tremendous influence. And never underestimate, dear friends, what God can do through you. No matter what opinion you may have of yourselves, don't ever underestimate what God can do through you, how he can use your witness, your words, your deeds to touch others, to bring others to that knowledge of Jesus Christ, that saving knowledge, to build others up in faith. But, dear friends, it has to be grounded firm and deep in his word, in the Bible. We must never stray from his word. Let that word be an anchor to our faith. But before we leave this morning, I'd like to say just a brief word of commendation for Eunice's husband. He was a Greek, and the implication is, is that he wasn't a believer. That's the implication, isn't it? Because Eunice is called, identified as a believer. The identity he had was a Greek, and that's it. Nothing is said that he was a believer, and I tend to think that if he was a believer, it would have been mentioned. Therefore, we can assume, I think, right? I, can, I think we can assume that he wasn't a believer, right? It's likely that he hadn't been converted to Judaism or indeed the Christian faith. But it seems to me, dear friends, that he clearly hadn't opposed Eunice in giving Timothy a Christian upbringing. Remember what we are told, that he'd learned these things from infancy. Now, there's no way you can teach children anything in secret. Daddy's head, <laughs> or mommy's head, isn't it? There's no way you can teach a child 
anything about the Christian faith and says, shh, no, don't tell your father that I taught this. Okay? So clearly, he didn't oppose, did he? As an unbeliever, the Christian upbringing that he had. Yes, the scripture says that we mustn't be unequally yoked. But I have known many Christians who have married other Christians simply because they are Christians. And I've been in the ministry long enough by now, and this is something I've discussed with my father many times over the years, who's also a retired minister now, that there have been many unhappy Christian marriages because people, in my view, have been unequally yoked, even though they are in the same faith. Does that make any sense at all? Oh, he or she is a Christian, and there's sort of influence, pressure pushed on them to have a relationship, to build a relationship with that person. And I've seen many, many, too many sad outcomes of such unions. I'd like to say a word about Eunice's husband. He didn't oppose. Timothy was allowed to have a Christian upbringing. It was so far reaching, a Christian upbringing that God used to great effect, even though Dad wasn't a believer. I would rather have a dad or a mum who wasn't a believer but didn't oppose my Christian upbringing than a dad or a mum who was a Christian but boys back put so many obstacles on my way. I take my hat off, if I knew. Mean. I don't know his name, but to Mr. Innes. I think Mr. Innes deserves a mention. An evident faith, an unfeigned faith, an influential faith. Heidi Jones, let your faith be evident. Heine Jones, let your faith be unfeigned. Heine Jones, let your faith be influential. Not for your glory, because you're nothing but a worm, but for the glory of God. Amen. Come, people of the risen King. Let's start to sing our final hymn.
And may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit remain with us now and forevermore. Amen.